reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. My name is Sam Whitehawk. I'm one of the pastors here serving alongside Jeff Froze. Uh, I hope you've been encouraged so far in our series in the book of Colossians, uh, because each week we're seeing Jesus as he reveals himself, and we're learning about the gospel, which is who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And so if you haven't already, turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 is where we're going to start. Uh, last week, Rick reminded us of the joy and the privilege of setting our minds on Christ. Uh, So if you look at Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1, Paul says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory." And so over and over, we've been getting this message, think about Christ, live for Christ. You are a believer, so you are in him. This is what we were reminded of over and over again. And so we left with this call to set our minds on things above where Jesus is, not on the earth. And it's this contrast that Paul is trying to make in Colossians. Set your minds above on Jesus, not on earth, not on sinful things. And why is that? It's because you have died in Christ. You are raised in him. This is what Paul is uh, teaching us. And so as he opens up chapter 3 with the idea of setting uh, our minds on Christ, he he wants our minds and our hearts uh, set on Jesus. But now he's going to begin to get practical about that phrase in verse 2 where it says, earth. And there's a reason we're to think about above where Christ is. It's because Jesus is holy. That means he's above, he's set apart, he's unique, he is sinless. There is no one like him. And yet if we are in Christ, we are to be holy as he is holy. Paul wants us to leave what's earthly behind us and to reflect the image of God in all that we do. And so here's a question for you, all right? Raise your hands if, and I gotta qualify this, if in the privacy of your own home, you enjoy taking off your dirty and stinky clothes and having a nice warm shower or bath and then that feeling of being clean. Who enjoys that? Most, yeah, pretty much everyone, all right? Uh, so that's very fair. So do I. Now, another question for you. Raise your hands if you enjoy taking off those dirty, stinky clothes that you wore before your shower, getting clean in the shower, and then coming out and putting on those exact same dirty, stinky clothes. Does anyone enjoy that? Okay, let the record show, no hands. Ryland's a maybe, he's tentative. But, <laughs> but, but I hope you don't. Okay, and this is the image and the language that Paul is going to use throughout Colossians chapter 3. It's this language of taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes. And it's this imagery that is in our minds because as believers in Christ, we are to take off our old clothes, we are to take off sin, and we are to put on Christ as we follow him. And so this is going to be the big idea that we're going to see over the next few weeks. So let's open up our passage with prayer. Heavenly Father, I I thank you that we get to open your word again and we get to see your glory revealed in the text. And so I pray that you would speak through me and all of my weakness and would you be glorified. Father, I pray that you would equip us by your Holy Spirit to put off the old life and the old sin that weighs us down and may we put on Christ as we walk in you as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's start in our passage. We're going to start right at verse 5. And Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, 
evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so the passage starts by saying, put to death. Now, anytime you start a passage or even a conversation with a phrase like put to death, it should make us pause and think about the severity of the topic. Now, anytime we're talking about the scriptures and we're opening up God's word, it, it truly is a matter of eternal life and death. Paul wants our mindset above where Christ is, not on the earth. And he also wants our hearts and our bodies to reflect the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, in all that we do. And so that's why he's going to begin by telling us to put sins to death, sins that are earthly. And so when he says things that are earthly, he's referring to the flesh or the sin nature that we have. Our desires or our actions that are unholy and rebellious toward God and not reflecting the character and image of the Holy Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so what does the Spirit of God want us to put to death? And we start with the very first vice, sexual sin. And I say vice because some scholars title these lists as vice list and virtue list. I thought that was a good way to categorize it. So my passage deals with vice list as, and, and as luck would have it, Jeff's passage next week deals with the virtue list. And so I wonder if the creator of our preaching schedule is attempting to say anything by this, which is Jeff, by the way. He makes the schedule. Uh, and I'm not mad, though, because next Sunday I'll be in the virtuous state of California. Uh, and so continuing on, the first sin or sins that Paul addresses here is sexual sin, sexual immorality. And the Greek word is... Pornea, and that's where we get the word pornography from. from. Sexual immorality, it, in, in one sense, it's simple to define. It's the uh, sexual thought or sexual acts done outside of the covenant of marriage between a biological man and a biological woman. Marriage between a husband and a wife. This is um, sexual immorality. Anything done outside of that, any thoughts done outside of that is what Paul is getting at here. Any sexual thoughts, any sexual acts outside of marriage and that covenant is sin and sexual immorality. The glorious covenant of marriage between a man and a woman is where God has designed the joyful act of sexual intimacy to occur. God does not hate pleasure. God has designed our bodies. He has intricately and wonderfully made our bodies However, he has designed sexual pleasure to take place within the boundaries of marriage and that marriage covenant. And so sex between a husband and a wife can be fun and pleasurable and can lead to the creation of human life. But sex is also part of some of the most um, horrific situations known in this world. As you think of uh, rape, or uh, prostitution, or molestation, or, or any of those horrific sexual sins that include evil acts of aggression and intent. So this same act that can be used to glorify God is also the same act that can be used to dehumanize and devastate people. And so can you see why God speaks about this so much in Scripture? Sexual immorality, when it is in us, whether that's through sex before marriage or outside of marriage, it's sinful and we must put it to death. And some scholars are certain that the first three words in this passage here are speaking of sexual sin, while other scholars think that all five are related to, to this particular sin. But ultimately, it's taking what God has created as good for his glory, and now it's, it's, it's using it to sin against him in rebellion. It's abusing his created order by sinning. Impurity is another way of speaking, uh, again, of, of sexual sin uh, instead of purity as, as, as God has designed things to be pure. Passion is another way to speak or refer to as, as uh, lust. And so meaning that, that th the things that we think about, even if we think about sexually immoral thoughts, is included in this sin that Paul is speaking about. And so if you consider in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jesus says that if a man looks with a woman uh, with lust in his heart, he has committed adultery with her uh, in his heart. And so what Jesus is saying is that just because you haven't physically committed the act of sexual immorality, it's still possible to sin in this way in your hearts and your minds, which means we are all susceptible to this temptation. And we all need to be on guard and put it to death in our lives. 
And this isn't just for males, but it's equally possible for females to sin in this way as well. And then evil desires and covetousness or, or greed, as some translations will say, this is a sin as well. This is something that some believe is referring to the sexual sin here in this passage. Um, you know, being the uh, sexual evil desires or the, the covetousness, meaning the desire and the insatiable lust for more of this sin. But these last two could also be separate. It could just be all evil desires. It could be all encompassing. It could be uh, coveting. Coveting is wrong, uh, whether you covet, covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's life or your neighbor's money. It's all a sin there. And the point is, these are earthly, these are sinful, and these are devastating to the human soul. And yet this is how an unbeliever lives in this lifestyle. And this is not how Christians are to live. This is how we lived before we followed Jesus. This is how you live if you don't know and love and follow Jesus yet. But this is not how Christians are to live. And this is what Paul is getting at. He's saying this is idolatry. He sums this all up as idolatry, which is the worship of anything and anyone is more worthy than God. It's loving self or other things more than God. It's elevating and worshiping sex and the body and money and anything as worthy than God, as more worthy than him. This is evil, and we must not stand for it as Christians. And yet, if we're honest, this has been one of the areas of our lives that has impacted us in a number of different ways. Whether it's a problem we're struggling with at the moment, whether it was something done to us, or whether it was something that we walked in perpetually in the past. Sexual sin scars, and it hurts, and it angers the living God. And left unchecked, this sin can do horrific damages to marriages, to homes, careers, family, faith. This this ultimately will impact an individual's eternity if there is unrepented sin. And this is why Paul says to put it to death because of how serious it is and the severity of it. He's basically, he's telling us, don't be casual with sexual sin. Just because the world lives in it and embraces it as normal and good and healthy and necessary, Paul says in other passages to flee from it and put it to death when it is in you. Put to death means to remove the person or the technology or the media or anything that causes you to sin and to fall short in this way. And it's so important that we do this. And keep in mind, we will talk later uh, about putting it to death. We will talk more because there are ways that have been done in the past that truly haven't been stopping, helpful in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. But we've got to be mindful of any sin or temptation as it comes for us. Whether that's coming through school or work or media or a person or a new relationship, we have to be mindful. And that's why as you look at the book of James in chapter 1, it says, But each person is tempted when he, was, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so notice that Paul is saying we're tempted because inside of us, not just outside, but inside of us is still a desire to sin and to live according to our old ways. We, for some reason, are drawn to our old, stinky, dirty clothes. We are, we're always pulled in that direction. And Paul says, be mindful of that and put it to death. And James is saying, hey, listen, when that desire inside of you is hooked on by sin outside of you and it begins to grow, it will bring forth death. And it is very serious. If you let this sin fester, and we call this unrepentant sin, that means you're not dealing with it, you're enjoying it, you're hiding it, you're not bringing it to Christ or to community, this is something that will eventually kill you. This is what James is warning about. And we read in the example of, in the book of Proverbs of the young man who was lured and enticed by the adulterous women to come to the house and, and to commit adultery. And, and the, I believe it's Proverbs 7 just summarizes at this. Her house leads to death when you walk down those steps of sin. This is how serious it is. And so I got a couple stories for you. I can't remember how long ago I shared this story, but I'll share it anyway because it seems to help make a point. Um, years ago, Allison and I bought our first house. And uh, long story short, it was horrible. And in a number of ways, it was miserable to live in. And one of the worst issues that we had was mice. The very first mouse that we found and captured, we decided as naive city folk with an affection for Mickey Mouse <laughs> 
we thought it would be a good idea to set it free. A couple of houses down in the back alley, right? Not in our backyard, but a couple of houses down for our neighbors. This is what we thought would be good. Well, that was stupid, okay? (laughs) Because although I can't prove it that that exact mouse came back, but I'm certain it did, um, we had more mice. Didn't solve the problem. Lots of them. And it got to a point where I quickly turned into the Terminator, and all I wanted to do was hunt them and put them to death. And I was joyful in this. Why? Because rodents are, when they're not put to death, quickly multiply and do more damage to your health and to your home. And I wish I knew this when I came across the first one. But the point is, Paul is saying, don't keep your sin around. Don't play with it. It will lead to death. And I believe Jeff has used this illustration before of of the baby lion Don't keep the baby lion in the cage thinking you're safe. It will grow and it will devour you. You cannot control your sin. You must put it to death. You're not safe if you're going to keep it around. And as one um, theologian has said, uh, John Owen, he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That language is a stark warning and reminder. Got another example from the movie Saving Private Ryan. I don't know how many of you have seen it. It was on this week. Uh, It was on TV, likely because of Remembrance Day. And so this may be a spoiler for you if you have not seen the movie in the 30 years since it's been out. But um, in the movie, this... The crew that's together there finally make it through an intense battle. And, And they have a chance to kill this last surviving Nazi soldier who surrendered at the last possible moment and killed one of their uh, fellow soldiers. And this, this prisoner begs for mercy and to be let free. And there's a debate amongst the group as to what they should do. And the majority of them want to kill this man because of what he just did and what he may do if he returns to battle. But instead, the captain decides to let him walk free. Fast forward to the movie's final battle. As the Nazi soldiers outnumber them 10 to 1, there is a hand-to-hand battle that takes place in in this broken-down house between two soldiers. And it's the prisoner who they had previously let go, and it's one of the men who wanted to kill this prisoner. Okay, And after this uh, difficult battle, this Nazi soldier slowly presses a dagger into the chest of the soldier who had previously wanted to kill him. And he killed that guy. And I want you to know, I'm certainly not advocating uh, for this, or I'm not talking about killing prisoners of war. But the point is this. The soldier who they released and didn't kill, at the first opportunity returned to kill that person. And as Mr. Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. This is the reminder that Paul is getting at in this passage when he says put to death. And so why is this so important for us to consider? I mentioned that sin is the ability to grow and eventually overpower us and overcome us. And, and if we let sin grow unrepented in our lives, it has a negative impact. Sin is never neutral. There are consequences to think about. And so as we get back to our passage, look at verse 6. This is the consequence of sin. On account of these, on account of these sins, the wrath of God is coming. On account of sin, the wrath of God is coming. And we've spoken about the wrath of God earlier in chapter 2. He's coming in wrath and in judgment upon this world. And it's because of sin in which sexual sin is included in that. God is coming in judgment and it is fearful. And we should know that no one is safe from the wrath of God apart from Jesus Christ. He will come upon this world with a fury never known before. And it's important that if you don't believe in Jesus today, that you turn from your sin and follow him because sin is that serious, that God's wrath is coming. And it's so serious that Jesus had to die for our sin in our place under the wrath of God. And yet all kinds of other religions out there, all kinds of false teaching like the Colossians are dealing with in their time are saying that sin is not that serious. We don't need to obey God's word. And yet it's all a lie. It's a demonic lie because God hates sin and his wrath is coming. And you got to know this. God's wrath will not be stopped by any sort of flimsy good works or religious practices. Good works are about as useful at judgment day as hiding under a desk when a nuclear bomb goes off. It will not help at all. Good works are useless. That's why we need Jesus Christ and his one perfect work 
on the cross. And so as we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, it says that when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, so the context here is that uh, Christians are suffering, and you can picture how, whatever that looks like, Christians being beheaded uh, or killed in, by lions in the Colosseum or gunned down in Sunday worship services as it happens around the world. But when all seems out of control and hopeless, Paul reminds them of the good news that God will avenge his people on judgment day. God is coming back again, regardless of how bleak and hopeless the situation looks. He will return on judgment day. And so as it says in verse seven, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So do you see the connection between the severity of our sin that Paul says to put to death and the impending wrath that is coming upon this world for sin? And as it's explained here, you do not want to be an enemy of Jesus on that day. But there is hope. There is good news for those who do obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as it says, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Remember what Rick preached from Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And the point is, his wrath and justice are coming and it will be poured out while simultaneously we who believe will be caught up into his presence, safe and sound, because Jesus took the wrath that we deserved. And we get the privilege of spending an eternity with him in glory because of his death and his resurrection. And that is good news. And so wrath is coming because of sin, and it's only a matter of time. We don't know when. But that's why we must take our sin seriously and put it to death. And that's why Jesus says now is the time to repent, turn away from sin and put it to death and turn to Jesus in faith because he can forgive us and he can change us. And so continuing on, verse six and seven, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. So Paul does this thing with words where he reminds us who we are in Christ now, but he also reminds us of who we were in Christ beforehand. And so Paul is saying that in these sins you once walked, meaning that before Christ you walked in these sins at one time in your life, but Paul's saying you were in Christ now and so you were to walk differently. That's what it means to be in Christ. You walk differently than you did before. And so the sign of someone being in Christ is that they are putting their sin to death. Sin that they once freely enjoyed without any inhibition, and they are now putting it to death. You'll notice it never says that the complete absence of sexual sin and temptation, as long as we live, will exist the second you become a Christian. That's not what it's saying. But it is saying that the sign or a picture of someone who is in Christ will look like someone putting their sin to death. And the sign of someone who is not in Christ is someone who will freely and joyfully dive headfirst into the sewage that is sexual sin without any sign of guilt or remorse or repentance or fear of the wrath to come. Meanwhile, the Christian, the Christian is the one who puts sexual sin to death constantly, ongoingly, continually. This is an act that we do as believers Right? It doesn't matter what the sin is, but we put sin to death in our lives. That's why Paul can contrast the former life with the current life. You used to walk in unrepentant sin. You used to walk in these ways, and now you are required to walk differently. Now you do walk differently. This is what Paul is getting at. It's a continual battle that we walk, and this is a sign that we will be saved by the wrath to come because it is Christ in us moving us step by step towards him. He is at work in us. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. It speaks about how you turn to God from idols. Right? So you once worshipped idolatry and sin and sex and everything else, and you turn to God. This is the act of salvation. You turn to serve the living and true God. And I love when the Bible qualifies this because other religions will claim to have access to gods and other kinds of things. The Bible's like, no, there's just one, the living and true. 
And then when you are saved, you begin to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So notice this description of what Christ has done for us and in us. He delivers us from the wrath to come. This is what he will do. He will protect us from this wrath because he took it for us on the cross. He took that sin penalty that we deserved and he died in our place. And then he transforms us and he changes us from the inside out by his Holy Spirit, Christ in us. This transformation is what happens in one moment when we believe. We are justified. We are saved. As Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. We have been made right with Christ in a single moment by faith. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And so when we believe we are turning from our idolatry and our old sins and our old gods that we used to worship and we're turning to the one true living God, and this is salvation. And this is what it looks like. And what do we do while we wait for the sun to return? We don't sit idly by, but we put sin to death. Slowly, painfully, step by step, we walk in Christ. We live less like the old life and more like the new life. We take off the old, dirty, stinky clothes and we put on the fresh, clean clothes in Christ because at salvation, he has made us clean. The putting on of the clothes isn't what makes us clean. We are clean in Christ. We are justified by his blood. And so the time in between now and then when he returns, we are to put on more of Christ. We are to reflect his image more and more. We are to look like him. And so as we get back to our passage in verse uh, 8, Paul begins to say that, but now you must put them all away, all kinds of sins, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And so again, it's this picture of you're taking off these old sins. And there's another list of sins that deal with the mouth. And it deals with the way that we relate to one another. Some scholars call these social sins. These are anger and wrath and malice, slander, obscene talk. This is the way that we uh, can be rude to one another. We can sin against one another. We can uh, curse one another. This is what this sin is getting at. And it starts with the mouth, but then it leads to other violent practices that causes harm to others. And so just as Jesus related lust in the heart to physical adultery in the Sermon on the Mount, when it came to this sin, he also equated anger in the heart to murder. The Holy Spirit, I feel, sums up the human experience apart from Christ so perfectly in Titus chapter 3, verse 3. This is not, especially during COVID, where we had a chance to really see how we act. Um, Verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, Slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. So malice doing something evil to someone else. And then this just summarizes the world. Hated by others and hating one another. We were defined by hatred. And yet, as we'll get to in later passages, in Christ we are defined by love. Hated by others and hating one another. It's a sad and perfect summary of the sinful man. All of us in the ways in which we once walked. And now in Christ, we have been changed by Jesus and we are called to walk differently. And so what is this kind of anger and all this stuff in our heart and in our minds and our mouths? Where does this lead to? This is how we get to violence and wars and disaster and death. And this is why Paul exhorts us to put sin to death. We aren't to live as we once did. And so that means if you were on Twitter before your salvation and are on Twitter after, your tweets should look a lot differently. It doesn't matter that you are anonymous and behind a keyboard. Your speech should reflect the glory of our Savior if you are in him. And as we went through the book of Proverbs this summer, if we are in Christ, we will be slow to anger. This is the reflection of our Savior. And not only that, we'll also tell the truth. We won't lie to one another. We'll be honest. This is how we will speak and deal with one another. Because Jesus is the truth and he never lies. We will put on Christ and we will put our old sinful practices to death. And this is what the Spirit of God does in us and through us. And so a helpful summary of this process of sanctification, and that means to be made holy and more like the image of the Son of God, 
A helpful summary that I've heard before goes like this. What we feed grows, and what we starve dies. I'll say it again. What we feed grows, and what we starve dies. This applies to people, pets, plants, and Tamagotchis. What we feed grows, and what we starve dies. Meaning that if we feed ourselves with the food of God's word, God's people, God's mission, we will grow in Christ's likeness. And if we starve our sin, it will die. Just like if we cut off oxygen from a fire. If we cut sin off from our lives, it will die. However, it also works in the opposite way. If we have a steady diet of sin and, and we feed ourselves on the garbage that this world offers, our lust and our sin will grow and our love and our passion for God will begin to die. And so I found this, help quote, uh, this quote helpful, but you don't take it to the extremes. Instead, look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, that talks about the spiritual warfare that takes place in our hearts daily. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And so here he's his calling us as believers in a similar way to Colossians to put on Christ. So if you want to put sin to death, walk by the Spirit. And that's why I said earlier, it is important to cut out the people and the things that tempt us and cause us to sin. But if we only view sin as external and outside of us, then we're going to miss the intense battle going on internally within our hearts. We can't put sin to death on our own. It will only lead to more failure. We do so by the Spirit. If we only deal with the external and we try to do with, without the Spirit of God, this is how we get what we saw in ver- chapter 2. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. You come up with all these man-made rules that ultimately they have the appearance of wisdom, but... They are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. We need the Spirit of God to put our sin to death. Don't try and do it without him. We need God. We need to walk in the Spirit and in Jesus. And so in verse 17, it goes on, if the desire, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So here's this battle going on within our hearts. What desire are you going to feed What desire are you going to starve? The command is to starve the desire of the flesh for sin and to feed our desire for the spirit. Then verse 18, it says, if you're led by the spirit, you're not under law. And there's another vice list. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. And so if you didn't see your daily sin temptation listed here, don't just come in today thinking, I'm so glad that today's passage dealt with his sin or her sin or their sin. But notice that, you know, with lists like these, Paul just says, you know what? And things like these, whatever your sin is that you're dealing with, we are all called to put our sin to death together to help one another walk as Jesus walked. And this comes with the warning. I warn you as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The point is, it doesn't matter what our sin is. Whether it's sexual or sins of anger or any other sins on, on all the lists there. We must put it to death in our lives by the Holy Spirit. And continuing on in our passage in verse 9. Uh, Paul says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so as we put on the Holy Spirit, we were reminded that this is God doing this amazing work in us. We cannot do it on our own apart from him. It's him working through us to put on the new self. This is what God does. He's the one that died so our lives could be hidden in Christ. And he's the one working in us so that the new self can be put on. So that we, our new self can be renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And this knowledge isn't uh, something hidden away or something earned at a new level of spirituality. This knowledge is the knowledge of Christ. It's the knowledge of the gospel, who he is and what he's done for us and what he's doing in us today as we put our sin to death. And to quote the ESV Gospel Transformation Bible, it says that it is as we learn of God's love for us that our hearts can be changed and we are moved to obey him from the inside out. I love that summary. As we learn more about who God is and what he has done for us, it begins to transform us. The spirit of God works in us to put our old life to death and to be more like Christ. So at the end of the day, it's God working in us, renewing us, 
putting off our old self, putting on our new self, which is Christ, as we're walking in him, as we're rooted in him, as we are following after Christ, as we're setting our minds on things above, as we're putting our sin to death, as we're putting on as holy and beloved children the image of Christ, all these things is God's work in us. We're being renewed after the image of our creator, and that's Jesus. As it says in Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. This is what it's telling us. And then in Romans 8, we're just reminded that, that if we walk in Jesus, we no longer walk in our old sin and our old shame. We are washed and forgiven and saved by Christ. And we are being conformed to the image of his son. And this actually, this is the greatest news we could ever hear. And Romans 8 tells us this isn't an accident. This isn't just luck that we came across an ad for a changed life. This is God's marvelous work in us. The work of God predestining us to conform us to the image of his son. This is what it says in Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So being renewed in the knowledge of Christ's image, being transformed into his image, this is a work that God has done. And this is a work that God has planned in your life if you are in Christ from before the foundation of the world. This is not an accident. We are walking in God's plan for our life. And it is good news if you are found in Christ because he is doing that work of renewal in you. And I say this is good news because as we battle our sin and as we deal with frustration, as we deal with setbacks and as we deal with guilt and shame and all kinds of other things the devil wants to use to turn us away from Christ, we were reminded that God is at work in us, renewing us. He's the one that has made us clean and he's the one that can put on the new clothes so that we can reflect the image of God. And then as our passage closes in verse 11, It says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And so here's what he's getting at. As we walk in this new life, in this new self, in the new image of Jesus Christ, as we walk in the knowledge of the gospel, which is about Christ and what he did for us, as we do this, we are united as a family, as brothers and sisters, into something that is new and is something that is greater than anything we have experienced before. He has d- died to create a new people. And this new identity that we have in Christ, is it transcends every relationship. And I'm not, not exaggerating here. It transcends every previous identity and relationship that we had before Christ. Being in Christ is better and more important than the family we were born into or married into. It's more important than our race or our class or our career or our country. Christ is in Christ is all. We learn that in Colossians 1. And he is in all. He is in any and every believer. And so if the Spirit of God is in you and in your fellow brother or sister, you are a part of a new family that is bigger and better than anything that you will experience. And this is how we'll close out the rest of the book of Colossians. Because although we have a few short years before Jesus returns and we go to be with him in glory, this new identity in Christ will transcend every relationship and it will change the way that we spend our time, even as we spend our time in our old cultures and and within our own relationships and structures. When we are in Christ, something amazing has happened and it transforms everything about who we are and what we do. And so in closing, I know I went long today, but we got to remember the sobering words that we began with. Paul has told us to put sin to death and he has reminded us of the impending wrath of God. And so let's never forget what Jesus has done for us. We must put sin to death. We must battle sin. We must put on Christ walking in the Holy Spirit. However, let's not lose heart over our struggles with sin. Don't be overwhelmed by the weight of your current sin and struggles or your past sin and shame. Take off your sin and put Jesus on. And if Paul, our example, if he can, without ever forgetting it, but if he can move beyond killing Christians and move into Jesus' love and forgiveness, then you and I can put our past failures and sin behind and walk in Christ's redemption that he offers. It never means we give up our fight against sin, but it does mean that we don't lose heart or we ever forget our new identity in Christ because Jesus has radically changed our lives. And this means we have a bright future ahead with Christ 
in eternity. And I wanted to close with 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. This is Paul. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, uh, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And, this is the gospel, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the hope that you have offered us in Christ. And I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit in us that we would put our sin to death. And we pray for more people to believe in you, to leave behind the old life, and to put on Jesus Christ. In your name, amen.